morning. It is Saturday. And part of what our program does annually is we put on this workshop for local high schoolers, kind of as a focus career fair in a way, doing a very elementary introduction to anesthesia for any future anesthesiologists out there. Brief little presentation. Um, it's gonna be very interactive because it's always more fun. Kids are not to do interactive stations. We're gonna have an airway station. Um, I'm gonna be running the IV station, ultrasound, fiber optic, stuff that will like get people excited and keep them engaged. Making some coffee, getting some calories in me, and then uh, we'll go. And this is like the first time I've been in the nice scrubs, like the nice scrubs, not hospital scrubs, in forever. Kind of nice, I miss it. tubing stations, fake arm, talked about IV access, flow rates, making sure the bevel is up and how you need to advance a little bit of it into the vessel after you get flashed. Did I do a decent job? Yeah, you did great. <laughs> <laughs> this was fun. Everybody thank you. Loved it. Thank you for putting the event on. Thanks for being here. Woo. Hopefully people had fun. Yeah, well, they yeah. Is there a tunnel? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Oh. Wait, the practice, the practice, this is like the Fisher Price version for the anesthesiologist. Practice. <laughs> That's so cute. Demo dose. <laughs> this is adorable, actually. Nephrin. <laughs> 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 So yes, I am actually getting a little break from being in the ORs because next week I start on my regional rotation. Now regional anesthesia may be something that doesn't exactly come to mind when you think of an anesthesiologist, but it is now an ACGME fellowship and it is arguably one of the most important and powerful ways that we give post-op analgesia. I have the weekend off before I start. So I have a quick trip to New York City to visit one of my friends. And then I'm gonna walk you through what it's like learning about regional anesthesia. But first, a quick word from our sponsor. Practice questions are and always will be one of the most efficient ways to learn new things and consistently challenge what you already know. That's where the trusted QBanks from Board Vitals is here to help. Board Vitals is a comprehensive and up-to-date question bank resource that is trusted by millions of healthcare professionals to prepare for the in-training and licensing board exam. From surgery, internal medicine, and subspecialties, nursing, dentistry, and yes, even anesthesia, Board Vitals has high yield review questions with explanations and graphics to make sure you get the most out of each question. Using in-browser and especially the mobile app, it is easy to create a small 10 to 20 question quiz during your downtime in between cases, on call, or while waiting for surgery to sign their consent. All to squeeze just a few questions in to continue exercising that brain each day during this marathon of residency training. After your call shift is over, Board Vitals AI powered risk assessment tools take your test data and make it clear exactly which topics need improvement. This has been crucial to guide my textbook reading in these early stages of anesthesia board prep and is an excellent way to help navigate what to read next, something we just don't have time to think about with our busy clinical schedules. Just one of the many ways Board Vitals prioritizes your clinical excellence at your pace and your convenience. With 100% pass guarantee, there's no wonder why thousands of medical training institutions choose this as their prep resource of choice for their students. If you would like to explore Board Vitals competitive pricing to accommodate to a broad range of learners, use the link in the description and use the code NDMD15 to get 15% off your QBank plan. Thank you so much to Board Vitals for supporting the channel and the medical education of millions. Claire is having her birthday party up in Upper East Side, so I'm gonna go say hi.
Yeah. You're on camera. <laughs> Happy birthday, Glam. Thank you. <laughs> for the first case starts, which could be anywhere from four to eight. This is our block office, our block ultrasound, obviously spine, bunch of models. These are our pre-made lock kits that we have to replenish every single day. That's chloroprep, short bevel, four inch, 20 gauge needle, syringes, sterile ultrasound probe cover. And then I'm about to bake a bunch of these. Our local anesthetic of choice is typically ropivacaine or bupivacaine. And we go through a lot of syringes every single day. So we constantly have to make them and replenish. But yeah, this is kind of what the day looks like. And it's busy. and catheters that we would place in the thoracic spine to help with pain there. I'm not gonna lie, these days are a lot later than I wanted them to be or expected them to be, but it's okay, I kind of miss the ORs. Scrub kept in building otters. So what exactly is regional anesthesia? And this is low-key gonna sound like how I consent my patients for blocks, but it is an ultrasound guided directed deposition of local anesthesia around nerves with the purpose of one, either giving full surgical anesthesia, or I think the better term would be full surgical analgesia, or giving you post-op analgesia to reduce the amount of opioid medication you would need for about 24 to 48 hours post-op. In either case, there are three kind of main areas that we do regional anesthesia. First is the peripheral nerve block, where you're trying to cover a dermatome of of an upper or lower extremity. This is most commonly for orthopedic procedures where they are working on a limb, say a broken wrist or a broken ankle. The most common blocks we do is the popsi, the adductor canal, and then some brachial plexus blocks like the supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and even a peng block if you're working on the hip. Then there are the trunk blocks where you are targeting the nerves coming right out of the spine. So you're not going into the spine, just 
where the nerves like the dorsal horn are coming out. These primarily target the abdominal region as well as the chest. The most common blocks that we do are the quadratus lumborum blocks, paravertebral, and then erector spinae blocks. Quadratus lumborum has been really, really revolutionary at Yale. And apparently a block that a lot of people don't do around the country that we're taught as residents, really effective at covering the abdominal region. And there's an OB surgeon that works here that basically has us block all her patients. And also these are the most common blocks that we put catheters in for, especially in the surgical ICU where you get a lot of car crashes, people with broken ribs, and they can't breathe as well because of the pain. So erector spinae blocks are really good at targeting the T4, T5, T3 dermatomes. And instead of just doing a single shot, you thread a catheter in kind of like an epidural and you have an infusion of 0.2% ropivacaine going at all times so that it gives you constant analgesia. And lastly, we have the neuroaxial blocks, which are your spinals or your epidurals. Yes, kind of the same epidural that you get for labor or a little more advanced something that they probably wouldn't let me try as a CA1 but thoracic epidurals for thoracic cases all things that make a huge difference in the post-op recovery of these patients undergoing pretty massive surgeries and even in the smaller elective orthopedic surgeries, it gives the ability to do these under literally just a regional block, a non-rebreather mask, and some moderate sedation, which helps to mitigate the risks of full-on general anesthesia and having to intubate and secure the airway and all that. This is what it takes to do blocks. Isn't that right, Manny? Yeah, <laughs> the primary medications that we use is ropivacaine and bupivacaine. Ropivacaine comes in 0.2% and 0.5% and then bupivacaine comes in 0.25% as well as 0.5% and then I've also seen bottles of 0.75% laying around. But overall, bupivacaine lasts a little bit longer and is stronger than ropivacaine. And the decision to use one or the other and then what percentage is kind of based off of how long the surgery is going to be, the type of block you're doing because some blocks you can use a higher volume of anesthetic and some you just don't have the space to use that high volume, what dermatomes you need to cover, and a lot of other factors that I'm probably forgetting right now because it's the end of the day and I'm tired. But you'll often also see that local anesthetic mixed in with Decadron and as well as Depot Medrol. Steroids that one, help the block last longer, but two, also ease the tapering of it off so it's not just like boom the block wears off it'll wear off nice and slowly so you don't have this huge jump in pain when it suddenly wears off and all these medications are in the block cart as well as intralipid which is the kind of treatment for our last kind of an emergency local anesthesia toxicity that can happen if accidentally put this local anesthesia directly into a vessel and not around the nerve like you're supposed to or if you give too much and it becomes systemically toxic. It literally looks like a bag of whole milk. But yeah, that's the treatment for it and we always have it in our carts. And all these blocks are done awake. Of course, you get a little bit of sedation, so a little bit of Versed, a touch of fentanyl. Most patients just kind of nap right through these blocks and then you just kind of tap them and they look at you like, oh, we're done. So it's pretty nice. The worst thing you'll feel is a little bit of a bee sting when the skin local goes in. Afterwards, you should just feel pressure, but not really any pain. Truly the hardest part about this is though, just this is all new. You gotta really know your anatomy and then also know what it looks like on ultrasound, which like even if you do know the anatomy, orienting yourself to what it looks like on the ultrasound probe and in what orientations is a whole nother ballgame. Nysora is a really good resource for learning these blocks as well as ASRA, the primary association for regional and pain anesthesia. They have great articles on all these blocks and I will always look at them before I do a new block the next morning. And of course, all these blocks are highly, 
highly board testable. This is, these are one of the board examiner's favorite types of questions to ask because it tests just pure rote memorization of anatomical structures and calculating max dosage of each anesthetic. Even though regional anesthesia is its own dedicated fellowship and there are regional anesthesiologists that literally just do blocks, this is still a very important part of an anesthesiologist practice because in a general practice, and especially if you're working private, you should be able to do all of your blocks by yourself without any further specialty training. So really, really important to get your reps in while you're a resident so you feel comfortable enough doing these blocks when you obviously graduate and go to attending hood. This is the first of, I believe, three regional blocks that we go through throughout our entire residency. Honestly, have learned a lot over the past two weeks and got to see the difference between working in a big academic institution with a formal regional block team and more of a ambulatory surgery center, private practice type model where you are simultaneously doing all your blocks and running rooms. Each have their pros and cons, absolutely to each their own. I'm gonna need a little bit more exposure and experience to figure out which one I personally like, but it is really cool on the big academic side where we round on our patients the next day and literally get to see them being in like two out of 10 pain from these massive abdominal surgeries because of the block. It's this weird oxymoron as an anesthesiologist where if you don't hear from your patient, that is the ultimate sign that you did an amazing job because that means they're not in any pain. And being on this regional block rotation is that rare chance to follow up on your patients and objectively, and I guess subjectively as well, see if you did as good of a job as you think you did. Let me know what questions you guys have about regional anesthesia below in the comments, and maybe I can get together some simulations for you guys. On to the acute pain service, and cheers to working on the holidays again.